Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, you know what? Um, every so often I like to break off of my series, and uh, we are kicking off a new one next week. But uh, today I want to talk about no doubt. Everybody say no doubt. Yeah. Have you ever said that? Have you ever used that expression? No doubt. Yeah. Well, guess what? God wants you to have that expression about him. He wants you to feel and think about him. No doubt. When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Now, the problem is it may not be in your timing, but God's timing is always perfect. Always perfect. And um, I... I taglined it, the point of no return. And the reason I tagged, I tagged it this way is because, you know what, we need to come to the place where not only do we not doubt God, but once you go all in with God, there's no going back to an old lifestyle, an old mindset, an old attitude. You can go back. If God keeps elevating you, progressing you, stirring you, then we want to keep going further with God you know what, if anything, we should be drawing closer to God as we're coming at, at, to his house, as we're reading his word, as we're praying. There should be a, a closeness that's happening between you and God. Let me give you a quick definition of the point of no return. The point of no return means this. It's the point beyond which one must continue one's current course of action because turning back is physically impossible. Can you imagine that? If you get to the place with God where you're just like, there's no way, there's no physical way that I would possibly even think twice about going back to that old lifestyle or that old way of thinking or whatever. You finish the sentence. Turning back is physically impossible, impossible, prohibitively expensive, or even dangerous. And it's really understanding that you know what? If I choose to quit, then, then I may not see the, the blessing or the breakthrough that God has. I've seen it, it, it. Listen, I see it over and over again. Christians are at the edge of the ledge of a blessing. They're at the edge of a ledge of a breakthrough. They're healing, whatever. But over and over again, people get at this edge. And right before they're about to just dive into God's blessing, they back off. Why? Because the pressure. The pressure of life hits you and, and, and the cares of life hit you and, and all these things that, that try to come to distract you, they, they keep you from ever moving forward with the plans and the purpose of God and then you start doubting and, and you have to be careful with this doubt. For example, I remember um, a few years ago, I was in Hawaii and uh, I, went, I went to a place called the, they call it the Black Rocks and uh, it's a real famous spot. And uh, it's about 40 feet uh, of a jump. And, and, you know, I've always been an adventurous. I still am. I, I love anything that has to do with crazy. And, uh, and, and I've done all kinds of things. Uh, been in tiger cages and uh, swam with sharks. You name it. I just love that stuff. And, uh, and I remember being here with my son Isaac. And, you know, Isaac was, uh, you know, a little bit younger. He was probably about maybe 14 at the time. And I said, hey, Isaac, uh, I'm all talking smack, you know, the dad thing, the dad talk, like, hey, boy, I'm going to go show you how a man jumps, and, you know, just talking smack, and he's like, okay, dad, I'm like, okay, let's go, so we're, I'm climbing this thing, right, you got to, you got to climb this thing, you got to swim out to it, and then you climb, and so, man, I'm climbing up there, being all bad and big and everything, and, you know, son, I'm going to teach you how to flip, I'm so anyway, I get to the top of this thing, and I look down, and I don't know if it's age, you know, I, <laughs> you know, but I, I'm like, I, I'm not kidding. I got dizzy. I started feeling like there's like no, I started doubting the courage that I had always as a youngster. And I mean, I'm telling you, when I was a kid, I used to jump up apartment buildings into pools. And that's how cray cray I was. And so now I'm at this spot and my son's looking at me like, what's wrong, dad? And I'm not, you know, 
parents, you don't tell your children you're scared. You never do that, right? Especially my son. And I'm like, oh, nothing. I'm just checking it out. You know, just small time. I'm just checking it out. You know, mijo. It's, you know, just, just looking. And so I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, oh, my God. I don't know if I can do this. And like anxiety and, and like fears trying to grip me. And all of a sudden, man, I'm doubting my skill set. I'm doubting the fact that, wow, I've done this before. I've jumped off of higher things than this. And so, you know what starts happening? The thoughts, they start just bombarding me and I'm thinking there's no way but then I'm like I'm like turning back to eyes I'm like hey Isaac you know what we don't really have to do this you know maybe let's just go to the other side on the back of this mountain uh, uh, or this rock there's a whole other area of like swimming it's coral amazing and and I'm like and I'm trying to convince myself I'm like son we don't have to do this is let's just go down there that looks so cool he's like dad are you scared I was like dang I'm like I'm like I'm not scared boy what's wrong with you and he's like, well, he's like, you've been looking at that for, I mean, I'm like, yeah, I was contemplating for like five, ten minutes. You know, everyone's jumping except me. I'm just, me and my son are just standing there like, just weird. Just, you know, did you guys come up here for the view? <laughs> what would you come up here for? Everybody goes there to flip, obviously. And I'm like, I ain't scared. And, and you know, I was, there's no way I was going to let my son use this against me. Because he would have just used it against me, come back to the church and tell, you know, our elders and pastors, hey, pastor's scared. And he would do that. I know he would. He's just, that's Isaac for you. He would do that. And so, and so I'm like, man, I'm like, ooh. And then I, like, I turn back and I'm looking and, and I'm thinking, I'm just going to walk down. But there was too many people walking up. And if I would have walked down, I would have interrupted what they were going to do. And I would have just caused traffic and craziness. And then what would they have thought? And so my son's like, you know, Dad, I'm going to go already. And he just goes and he just, whoo, he's gone. I'm like, ah. And I'm trying to convince him before that, like, Isaac, bro, you don't have to do this. You don't have to prove anything, bud. We're good. I'm having this whole conversation. And he realizes, Matt, my dad's scared. And I'm like, no, I'm not, man. I'm not scared. I'm just thinking. And so, so he jumps, he jumps, and he goes in. And you know what? I'm not kidding. Man, sometimes your ego can get the best. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to walk back off this mountain. And so, man, I jumped, but I jumped scared the whole way coming down. And it was, I, I got set free and delivered. It's amazing. Listen, it's amazing. It's amazing how, how the enemy will find a way to get into your life. When you're walking with God, where all of a sudden, when you had this assurance, this confidence in him, but somehow you grew up so much in your Christian walk that you really don't believe him. I mean, you believe in him, but you don't believe in what he can still do. And so, obviously, BC before Christ, we're walking all cray cray, right? We're like all over the place, and you know, we're getting dabbing into drugs, alcohol, you know, not everybody. Some people partying, you know, some people cussing, whatever, uh, violent, abusive, you name it. We're all, but then we come to Christ, right? And, and God is so awesome because you know what? When you come to Christ, He makes things so easy for us. To just really allow us to experience his faithfulness. So when we start with it, God's like a plank. Really. God's like a plank. And, and I say this because in Matthew 7, the Bible says that, that broad is the way, right, that leads to destruction. And many go through that road. But narrow. Everybody say narrow. But narrow is the way that leads to life and only few go through it. Why is that? Well, I mean, when I think about. No doubt, I'm thinking about a guy by the name of Cortez. Now, the guy was a wicked, evil guy, okay? So don't be sending me any bad emails like, I can't believe you spoke about Cortez. Okay, well, here's the deal. He was a wicked man, but he had the right principle. When he landed on Veracruz, you know what he did? When he was in his adventure, when he was in his mission, when he was in his, his calling of whatever it is that he wanted to do, he burned the ships that got him there. And he said, he said, there's no way that we're going to get back. You see, you need to come to the place with God where you can't give yourself any reason or an option to go back anymore. Some of you, you're already about to graduate from here to here. And let me tell you something. It's going to be a little scary. It's going to get a little bit, you know, rocky sometimes too. But God wants to keep taking you from glory to glory to glory, to why wow, that's that's how God rolls. He wants to take you to new levels in, in your spiritual walk with Him. 
It, it, he, he wants us to, to be able to walk with him and completely trust him in every season of our life. But I want to talk about how is it that this doubt creeps in, but also how do we address this doubt? Because we all face doubt, every single one of us. When I opened this church, I doubted God for a minute. We started with 12 people, and I thought, is anyone ever going to come? You know, and you start questioning. You start doubting. Think about it. Doubt is the original sin from the beginning. Y'all remember that? God says to Adam and Eve, you can have all this, but of that tree of good and evil, you shall not touch lest you what? Die. What do they do? <laughs> Saying comes in, and he starts having a little conversation with Eve and starts saying, hey, God really say you can't eat from that? He starts saying, maybe God didn't really say not to eat from that tree. And we're like, well, it's, it's a mango. All the rest are mangoes, you know? And Adam shows up and said, hey, what you doing, girl? And then he, she tells him, well, did God really say that we shouldn't touch that? I did he, doubt always says, did God really say? That's doubt. Doubt, if you want to go back to the founder, his name is Satan. And, and the woman and the man then start questioning what God had already said. Isn't it interesting when you're dealing with sickness? For example, you guys already know my story. Okay, cancer. I dealt with cancer. Okay, well, that was a battle. Doubt kept coming. I don't think you're going to make it. I don't think you're going to live very much longer. What did God say? By his stripes, we're healed. Huh? See, at that moment, you have to decide, who am I going to believe? Doubter or waymaker? That's what happens to us so much. Perfect example. Let's take Peter. I want you to go with me in your Bibles real quick. Go with me to uh, go with me to Matthew chapter 14 quickly. Because you know what? Every single one of us, okay, we've come to the place of seasons where you're excited about God. Yay! And, and you know what happens is if you're not careful, you're all about hype and not transformation. And, and hype only lasts so long. And God wants to take us from, from being this emotional, unstable roller coaster to being a person that is well grounded in his word. So that that word, because God is the word, right? So God is your plank. And, and God wants you to completely trust him. Now look what happens here with, uh, with Peter. He says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, and he was walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in what? Fear. So if the disciples can cry out in fear, so can we. It's okay. Don't trip. You're not a perfect Christian, okay? And so they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, man, take courage. Everybody say, take courage. Okay, so they're facing something fearful. They're facing something scary. They're facing something that they've never seen before, a ghost walking on water. Okay, I'm telling you right now, in your next season, you're going to face something you've never been before. So many times the reason we never enter in is because we still think about, well, I've never done that before. Duh, I know you never have, but God wants to take you there, right? And so God wants to take you to places that you've never been before. And so the disciples are in a place they've never been before. But check this out. One disciple out of all of them, you know who that is, right? Faithful old Mr. Peter, right? Peter says, uh, after he hears, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus replied, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, and he walked on the water, and then Jesus came towards him, 
But when he saw the wind, everybody say when he saw. When he saw the wind and when uh, uh, and he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him and he said to him, what? You of little what? He said, why did you? Let's talk about this. Why does doubt creep in our life? He saw, he saw the, the wind that was literally the wind of disaster. Think about it. He's, he's, he's seen the winds. And, and then next thing you have is then he's being beat with waves. Notice that this isn't a spiritual warfare in the tangible sense, meaning that the wave, okay, was something physical that was taking place. What he was doing was supernatural, but when you're walking with God, it's a supernatural thing, but there's a physical that comes with that, that tries to distract you from the one you're serving. All kinds of distractions. It could be a man, a woman, it can be alcohol, it can be drugs, it can be pornography, it can be, man, you know what, it can be business. Hey, let me tell you for you business owners, if you're saying, man, you know what, man, I'm just so blessed, but you don't go to church anymore? I'll tell you right now, that's not a blessing from God. That's your blessing. You did that. Because God says, my riches come without any sorrow. And God's riches should be drawing you closer, not further from God. So you got to come to that revelation. Because then we start doubting and we start thinking and we start getting it twisted. And so here, uh, you have Peter. Peter is now... He's walking on water. He has his, the Bible says that he was walking towards Jesus and Jesus was walking towards him. But what happened? You know what happened? The reason he started doubting Jesus. Notice it didn't say, why didn't you have faith? He said, why did you have little faith? So if you can have little faith, what's the opposite of little? Big. So God wants us to go from little to big. God wants you to go from here to here. From here to here. God wants you to keep growing and going. Growing and going. And so he says to him, why did you doubt? Well, we know why he doubted. He began to look at the waves of destruction, and he began to the, look at the winds of misfortune. And you know what happens? As we start looking at all the tangibles, you get your eyes off the prize, and his name is Jesus, and then you start doubting. See, it's the enemy's perfect plot. From the beginning, Satan came to get Adam and Eve eyes off God. The reason we deal with, we deal so much with doubt in the church, let's not talk about unbelievers, this is about Christians right now. The reason Christians deal with so much doubt is because slowly but surely we take our eyes off Jesus. You take your eyes off Jesus, you put your eyes on man, and then man hurts you, then you fall. But how about this? But God is so filled with mercy and grace that he looks at Peter and Peter cried out to God and Jesus picked him up, lifted him up out of the water, stood back on the water, huh, and puts him back on the boat. Let me tell you something. If God was willing to show that kind of grace and mercy for Peter, he can do that for you and me too. That's the good news. But we've got to put our eyes back on Jesus. And then he has to, he has to, he has the question, why, why, where was your, why'd you doubt? You have to ask yourself, why am I doubting right now? Maybe some of you are doubting your walk with God right now. You're doubting whether or not God is real. You're doubting whether or not God's going to do anything for you. You're doubting, constantly doubting. God wants to promote you. You doubt it. God wants to bless you. You doubt it. God wants to, you know, for some of you, he's, he's, he's bringing you into this church and you start doubting. You know, he's bringing you a new relationship. You start doubting. You know what? We have to kill doubt from our life. We have to kill doubt from our heart, and there's a way to do that. Obviously, right here, Jesus gives us the answer, and the answer to kill doubt is called faith. Faith will always kill doubt. Now, let's talk about this thing called faith. Are you guys with me here today? Let me give you a truth real quick before we go on. We are never a product of our circumstances, but of our decisions. Please stay with me. You're never going to be a product of your circumstances. Peter is walking on water. 
He's not, he wasn't a product of his circumstance. He was a product of what he decided to do. He decided to take his eyes off who? Jesus. Therefore, the circumstance did what? So it always starts with a decision. And then you become a product of the decisions that you and I make. That's the product that we become. Okay? Let me share this with you. This wasn't on my sermon today, but God spoke to me at the 8 a.m. And I want to do this because I think what happens is, you know what? Some of us parents, we, we, have, been, we have been gripped with shame because our kids are maybe not where we want them to be. And mom, dad, you know, grandma, grandpa, you know you did everything you possibly could. And, and, and now they're, they're off and, and they're not serving God. They're not loving God. They're not, they're not seeing God the way you see him. But let me tell you something, mom, dad, grandpa, grandma. Here's what the Bible said. The Bible says that our children are like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So just think this. They're like, they're like arrows. Um, and so let, let me borrow a young kid. Any young kids in here? May I borrow you for a second? Yeah, come on up here real quick. Let's give her a big hand. She was like, sure. Awesome. Okay. So, so here's the arrow. How old are you? 11. 11 years old? Awesome. You know, what's your name? Natalie. Natalie. Very nice to meet you, Natalie. Mauricio Ruiz. And so Natalie, so let's just say I was, uh, is, is Natalie's dad here? Is dad here? No, he's not here. Okay, so let's just say I was your dad. Okay, we're just role playing. Okay, let's just say your dad. Come over here better. Come over here so people can see us. Up here, let's come up here. You can run too. Come on. <laughs> so the Bible says that our children are like arrows in the hand of a warrior. Okay? Parents, I want you to get this real quick. The child is the arrow, not you. We are the bow. Our job, okay, here's the arrow. I'm the bow. Our job is to... Hmm. Hmm. is to point them in the right direction. Our job is to point them to God. Okay, so check this out. At some point, we're going to shoot this arrow. We shoot this arrow that God has given us because this arrow is now a product of my decision pointing her in God's direction. But now, little Miss Arrow is responsible for how far she will go. That is no longer my responsibility. That is her responsibility. And what's happened with parents is we have been gripped with so much doubt as what kind of parent you are. You've become a product of your own lies and your shame and your guilt and condemnation that you keep blaming yourself for the children that have gone off Listen, as long as you, mom, dad, as long as you have pointed them to God, it's up to them how far they go with Jesus now. And you have to be okay with that. You have to just go ahead and release and say, okay, God, I did my job. I pointed them to the living God. And at at, at this point, our arrows, my kids, my son Isaac, my daughter Alexis, it's on them now how far they're going to go with God. And we have to be okay with that. Amen? Let's give her a big hand. God bless you. And I, why do I share this? I don't know. I think parents need to hear this. Because we're never a product of our circumstances. But we are a product of, of our decisions. Okay? So doubt is not just being uncertain. It's also having a personal conviction. Okay? So, so many times we just say, I'm uncertain. No, it's also about having a personal conviction because doubt means this. It's a feeling of uncertainty or lack of conviction. That's what the word doubt means. That's the Webster's Dictionary, okay? So think about this. What's conviction? Well, when you think about conviction, conviction is when I've already made a, a, a decision, okay, that, that my moral compass will always point true north. In other words, my conviction is what keeps me walking on the plank with God and not turning back. My conviction, which is the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me, is the one that is always tugging at my heart when I'm, I'm, when I'm walking outside of the boundary that God has given me. It's a conviction. God wants us to come back to the conviction. Perfect example, Abraham was able to trust God 
and not doubt God, not because he was a man who was, you know, you know, uncertain about what God was going to do, because we all deal with uncertainty. Let's just be honest. It was his conviction that pushed him through. Watch this. Go with me to Romans quickly. Romans 4. Are you guys getting something so far? Well, I'm not done yet. I'm not done. So this is just foundation, and then we're going to hit it hard. Romans 4. Look at this. Verse 18 through 22. When there was no reason for hope. Look at this. When there was no reason for what? When there was no reason for what? There was no reason. Get it right. There was no reason for hope. Abraham believed because he had hope. When there was no, in other words, when there was no reason, there was no reason for me to even be blessed like this, but because I believe God, man, I am blessed and I'm moving forward with God. When there was no reason for me to live with this cancer, but because I believed God, I hoped in him. And he says, and he became the father of many nations, exactly as God had promised. God said, who said? Okay, see, this is where you guys got to get this, guys. Get this, please. Because if not, if things are just going to fly over your head, and I'm shooting arrows at you, okay? God said, look at this, and God said, that is how many children you're going to have. Obviously, if you understand the story of Abraham, Abraham had no children. And God said, all he told Abraham is, guess what, Abi? One day, you will have a son, and you will name him Isaac. And so we know the story. So he's 85 years old when God said, 85 at the time. So in this story, 15 years later, he says, and Abraham did not become what? Weak in his what? Please understand, God spoke to Abraham when he was 85 years old. I'm going to give you a son. And he had to wait 15 years. Man, God says something to us. And we're tripping after 24 hours. Why ain't it happening yet? Why ain't he moving yet? A week goes by. I thought God was going to do this. I thought God was going to bless me. I thought God. And it's like, Abraham's like, 15 years, bro. Huh? Oh, we'll take it further. Look at this. So, so here's what. But, but it wasn't just that, that Abraham believed. Abraham was, was a human like you and I. He also had emotional setbacks like you and I do as well. But he became the father of many nations. And, and God says, and this is how many children you're going to have. And he wasn't weak in his faith. But he accepted. Everybody say he accepted. He accepted the fact that, man, he was past the time when he could have children. And at that time, Abraham was about 100 years old. He also realized that Sarah was too old. To have children. So everything was going against them, right? But for some reason, Abraham was able to stay the course of a word that was given to him 15 years prior to this verse. How did he do that? Because I'm telling you right now, there are some promises that God has made to me that I have yet to see happen. And it's been years, but we have stayed the course. It's not your time. It's not my time. It's his time. And so look at this. But Abraham kept believing. He kept what? Believing. He kept what? Believing. He kept what? Believing. When things aren't working out, you know what you do? You keep what? Believing. You have to keep believing. Well, how do I do that? We're going to get to that. But Abraham kept believing in God's promise. He became what? Strong. See, you become weak when you stop believing. But when you just keep believing, you become strong. Stay with me. And he was absolutely sure that God had the power to do what he had promised. In other words, it's not in your power. It's in his power. God has the power to do what he promised. And he says, and that's why God accepted Abraham, because he believed. So his faith made him what? Right with God. Come on, that's... If anything, I don't want to doubt God just to get something. Man, I don't want to doubt God because I want to be right with him. When you're right with God, everything else is the added blessing. It's not about getting the promise. It's about being right. And when you're right, you get the promise. Does this make sense? So, so obviously, how did Abraham weather 15 years of waiting 
and waiting and growing stronger in his faith. Well, let me tell you this. You know what he did? He did a holy cow. Everybody say cud. It's what, it's what he did. Let me explain this. First of all, I'm the cow whisperer, just so you all know. Uh, my daughter and I, were, we were at a conference, and we were driving through, like, like Nowhereville. And it's just farm. And, and, I, was, and, and I pulled over, because I saw a whole bunch of cows. They fascinate me. Cows fascinate me. And so I drove by, and, and I told my daughter, hey, let's stop right here. It's like, for what, Dad? I want us to go see the cows. She's like, okay. And so I get off. And, and you know what? I'm not kidding you. There was at least 40, 50 cows. Alexis is here. She was here at the age. She, she said, Dad ain't lying. Okay, I did a sound, which I'm not going to make here, okay? <laughs> and, and, you know, I have a way with animals. For some reason, um, I was in Thailand at, at doing a missions uh, with, with kids that have been human trafficked. And while we were there, they took us out to, to go see some tigers. But you can pay extra money and go into the tiger's den. And I figured if Daniel could go into the lion's den, I can go into the tiger's den. I can start a whole new biblical story, right? So I go in there with my, my wife and my pastors, and they're fine and everything. Then I walk in, and I'm like going, and the tiger just literally just does this. And, and, and you know what? And the trainer says, don't move. I'm thinking, what? What, what, do you, what, what? what do you mean don't move? He's like, don't move. He's like, slowly walk back. I'm like, why are we slowly walking back, you know, because obviously I'm his lunch, and so, and so anyways, so we're done with the whole thing, I made it alive, obviously I'm here, but I asked the trainer, why, what happened, he said, you have a dominance, and so when they saw you come in, they were claiming territory because of your dominance, but I'm like, it makes sense, now I know why I'm the cow whisperer, so anyways, so I'm right there, and, and I start making these noises, and this said, God is my witness, okay? And I'm a, I'm a, I made the call. I made the call. All 40-plus cows came to me. I felt like Noah for a moment, man. I'm not kidding you. And, and, and then check this out. Then I start, I start walking this way just to see, like, could this be real? Like doubting, right? Doubting. And I, can this, and I start walking, and all the cows are following me where I'm going. I'm thinking, man, I feel like Moses now leading his people, right? Then I get back in the car and I'm driving. I'm like, man, I'm telling, I'm like all hyped. I'm like, Alex, did you see that? I'm the cow whisperer. She's like, she's like, Dad, whatever. I see another set of cows. I said, I'm gonna do it again. I'm like, let's validate this right now. I get off the car. I go out there. I did the same call, and all those cows came to me. It was the most amazing thing. Okay, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because have you ever noticed that cows always do this? Yeah. Right? Have you? They're, they're always chewing. Chewing, chew. Well, here's what happens. Cows have um, four different stomachs. Two of them are, 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 are the most important, uh, and I can't remember the name. It's like Renum and some other name. Here's what happens. The cow chews his food or her food. I don't even know if there's a boy. Is there a female male? Yeah. Females, right? They, they chew. The girl chews. She, she's chewing her stuff, right? Chewing. And so what happens is, as they're chewing their food, they're chewing their food all day and all night. So they're chewing their hay. The hay goes down into the first stomach. That stomach, what it does, it creates acids and fluids and all kinds of stuff. And it turns this, this, this digestion of hay into this ball. And then at night, while the cow is sleeping... It's still chewing, even at night. And so you know what it does? That stomach, re, kind of re, 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 what's that? Re, regurgitate back up the what's called the cud, and the cud now is this huge ball in the mouth. And then the cow brings it back down into the second stomach. The second stomach then takes that cud and begins to. To create that, that cut becomes the nutrients in order to produce the finest milk and the greatest carne asada and hamburgers that we get to enjoy <laughs> every single time. It's the most amazing thing. Why do I share this? Why do I share? Why cut? Because Abraham got the revelation 
of God. Slow it down. Joshua 1 verse 8, look at this. He says, keep this what? Book of the law always on your what? Okay, so let's just call it mouth. Keep my word always in your mouth, on your lips. Meditate on it day and If you, go, if you go deep in the word meditate, the word meditate actually means chew. Chew on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Check this out. And then, everybody say, and then. And then you will. Not you might. Not we hope. Then you will. You will be prosperous and you will be successful. How did he do 15 years? Cut. What did he chew on? God's word. What did he chew on? God's promise. He just kept chewing it. How was it that he kept getting stronger? Here's how. Because when you do cud, it starts out all out of place right it's just everywhere but as you keep chewing it it begins to take form right why because you begin to digest the word of god see when you chew on a word when you chew on a scripture you know what happens you're chewing it for what purpose why do i need to chew on it because god says listen the words this is what jesus said the words that i speak to you are not carnal but they are spirit the reason God needs you to chew is because that word that you chew on day and night, day and night, eventually gets down into your spirit. And once it gets down into your spirit, you know what begins to happen? It begins to strengthen you. And every time doubt comes, fear comes, anxiety comes, fears, whatever it is, you know what? That word is so rich in you. It's not only milk, it's meat, and it's so awesome. Nothing is going to deter you from that. Why? Because I already have this word in my spirit. It's too late. You can't get this out of me anymore. So what is cut? I created my own acronym of cut. It's chewing undoes doubt. When you begin to chew on God's word, you will begin to undo all the doubt that comes in to try to tell you, It'll never, you won't, you can't. You start, you stop all that nonsense. God needs to get the cud back in our life. We need to start reading the word. We're trying to chase so many other things, trying to fix ourselves with so many stuff. And listen, don't get me wrong, I, I like stuff, but at the end of the day, your only healer is Jesus. The only one that can produce for you what you're believing for is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and nothing that was made was made without the Word of God. So if the Word of God was good in the beginning for God when He created everything that we get to experience today, when He created this world, it says in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And nothing, ever say and nothing. And nothing was made that was made without the Word of God. Why am I not growing, Pastor? Because you don't meditate on the Word. I'm believing for that business, that career. Okay, tell me the two scriptures you're meditating on. What you chewing on right now? What's in your mouth? I mean, you're already using all that energy to chew on negativity. How about just go ahead and replace it with a balanced diet called the Word, and you start chewing on that Word, and you watch and see what it will do in you. This word is a life. The Bible says that the word is living and it's active. Man, this word is ready to just wreck you for new. This word is ready to renew you, change you, transform you, elevate you, take you to places you've never been before. Think about it. Peter never walked on water. He walked on a word. Come. And it was the word that he walked on. He went not water. His feet didn't even touch the water. He was walking on every word that came out of Jesus. Come. I wonder how many times you said come. Keep coming. You know, like when your baby first starts walking, and you're like, come, come. 
and you're moving back. Why? Because you're so excited that your baby is finally walking. Your baby is finally doing what he or she was designed to do, walk. You were designed to serve God and to walk with God and to live with God and to believe in God and to trust in God and to rely on God and to serve your God and to love your God. And I'm telling you, and he just keeps saying, come, come. You get this word inside of you. It gets in your spirit. And let me tell you something. When stuff happens, boom, this comes out. When they said to me, Mauricio, you have Hodgkin's lymphoma, the first words out of my mouth to that doctor were the most important words. And listen, some people may call me religious. Call me what you want, but I'm alive. I looked at the doctor and I said, doctor, by the stripes of Jesus Christ the Nazareth, I am healed. And of course, they laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Guess who got the last laugh? My God, my God got the glory and all the honor and all the privilege, and that's what God wants to do in you. Meditate, chew. What are you chewing on? Because you'll become a product of what you chew on. What's in your mouth? Life and death are in the power of your what? And those who eat it will what? They love its fruit. I don't know about you, man, but I like bubblegum flavor. We need to get some Jesus flavor back in our mouth. Bow your head, close your eyes. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.